and welcome to mini episode 229 of Real Life Ghost Stories. And I have three spooky stories for you today. And the last story comes from the 31st of October 2022. And story number one comes from Anonymous. I don't remember much, but I've heard stories. When I was young, I lived with my mom, but would frequently visit my dad. At the time, I think my grandma lived with us. We used to live in this run-down looking house. My dad once told me that when I was a toddler, I walked into the bathroom down the hall where my dad was shaving his beard and asked if I had a sister. My dad must have told me no and asked why I asked that, and with all my childhood innocence I promptly stated, because I saw a little girl in the hallway. To this day I wonder who she was, and why she appeared to me. There was no mention of her ever again. My older cousin, who was close in age to me by two years, used to visit my old house. In that house, if you entered the kitchen and if you were to look straight forward, you would see a pitch black doorway with a thin looking veil pinned to the top of the door frame that would drape over the doorway as if it were the door itself. This doorway led to a flight of stairs going straight down into the basement where our washing machines and a storage room were. I remember my grandma telling me that my cousin, who was toddler age at the time, would walk up to the top of the stairs and start talking to someone in the basement. As I am sitting here typing this email, I can remember vividly the fear and on-edge feeling I would feel if I were to look in that pitch blackness as if I were staring into it right now. I used to live in a house where there was a basement in the kitchen. So in the kitchen there was a set of stairs downwards and sometimes if the door was open to the basement it was obviously just, you know, the, the, the stairs would go down into this black abyss. It wasn't a particularly scary basement. But there were a couple of times at night time where I was sitting in the kitchen and the door to the basement would be open and I would be like, oh, that makes me feel very uncomfortable. I'm going to have to close this door because that is very unpleasant, that feeling of staring into the abyss. And then to have a child standing at the top of those stairs, chitter chattering to nothing, to somebody apparently that was in the basement. No way, you'd want to be burning the house down. Absolutely not. And story number two comes from Lindsay. Myself and my son moved into a house when he was around four months old. We only lived there for about two years. This house was most definitely haunted. After only a couple of nights living there, we started to hear the activity at night, and considering I was only 21 at the time, I was petrified with it all. It would be small things that started happening to start with, like someone walking up and down the hallway while we were in bed, and they would pull at the handles of the doors. To start with, my son and myself moved quickly into the one bedroom, while my own room was getting decorated, which didn't give us much space. Also, with this bedroom, there were two external walls, which left the room really cold. So giving this, I got us a small electronic radiator to help heat the room. One night I headed to bed, my son was already asleep in his cot. I jumped into bed and instantly felt someone climb in behind me, cuddled into me with their arms diagonally across my chest and I could feel their legs tucked in behind mine. I froze. Then I remembered I hadn't switched the electronic radiator off. It felt like I lay there for ages trying to build up the courage to get up and turn it off. Eventually I did. The radiator plug sparked as I flicked the switch off with the wall. I believe that if I had left this on all night, the house would have went on fire, which made me believe that it may have been a family member who was looking out for me and my son that night trying to protect us. After I jumped back into bed, I could feel the figure cuddle back into me, and this brought me great comfort that someone was trying to protect us. Another night in the house, I decided to sleep on the couch, as my room wasn't finished at this point. But while going into my son's room, he would often wake up. So after switching everything off one night, I settled down onto the couch. Then I heard someone coming up the stairs, opening the top hall door, walking up my hallway and opening the living room door. I lived in a four block flat and it was an upper flat. To this I looked up expecting to see my dad who had a key to my house. No one was there. So, trying to be brave and build up the courage, I called out, Dad? And got no answer. I got up off the couch and went to the living room door, called again and no answer. I made my way to the top hallway door and still no answer. I eventually made my way terrified to the front door to check I had locked it. The door was locked with my key still in it and the key was also turned slightly. So if anyone from the outside tried to put a key in, they couldn't and my key wouldn't be pushed out. 
This terrified me that night. Another night in this house I had a friend over. We were having a catch up and our kids were playing in the living room. My son was about two years old at this point and it was not long before we moved out of the house. He loved Thomas the Tank Engine and had lots of Thomas trains to play with. On this night one of his trains, which hadn't worked for months, started going on its own. My son was still not great at speaking at this point and he started freaking out and shouting about the girl. Again, it was only my son and my friend's son that were there that night. This continued for about 10 or 15 minutes that this train wouldn't work for any of us but would only work for this girl that only my son could see. My son then said to us, The girl up in the sky. Pointing to the window and the train stopped and it never worked again. This house was located in a small town called Airdrie near Glasgow in Scotland and it was only myself and my son that lived there. I still have spirits that follow me around to this day, guiding and protecting us, but at that point in my life I was young and terrified with the amount of activity we were getting in that house. I also can only imagine that you felt very vulnerable. Not only are you living in this flat on your own, but you also have the responsibility of a baby, like a four-month-old. And that is so much pressure for anybody, let alone a 21-year-old. And then all of a sudden you're hearing footsteps walking around your flat... And I honestly don't know what I I would do if I was lying in bed and I felt somebody get into the bed beside me. I know, Lindsay, I know that you said that you felt like it was protecting you and that it was, it had happened because you had left the radiator on. And those, I do also know, those electric radiators are lethal. They can fold so easily and can cause fires. So thank God that your spooning partner was there because it made you think, oh shit, I need to turn the radiator off. And then you did it and protected you and your son and your possessions and your flat and all of that stuff. But if if I felt somebody get into the bed behind me and spoon me, I think I would just simply expire on the spot. Done and dusted. Like I've said before, I feel like the afterlife, even when it's a positive afterlife, they need to figure out a way to communicate more effectively that, that does not involve non-consensual touching or freaking the shit out of people. Would it be possible to just send a nice letter? Although that would be equally terrifying if a letter arrived from a dead loved one. Either way, that apartment, that flat sounds really, really scary. And every so often, because I live in a townhouse, I hear people running up and down the stairs on either side, on either house on either side of mine. And every single time it gives me a fright initially and I'm like, what the fuck? Because it always sounds so loud and it always sounds like, oh my goodness, is that in my house? Like, is somebody running up the stairs in my house? And obviously it isn't. But even that is enough to scare me. So I can't imagine what w- what I would feel like if I was then hearing those footsteps and thinking, okay, somebody actually is in my house. Then you realise somebody isn't in your house. Either way, it's terrifying. And I think the simple answer to, the simple solution to all of this is just to never give children toys either. Because they're just freaky. They'd be talking to people who aren't there. The toys come to life. They're sharing their toys with imaginary friends. Just this is my petition to stop children having toys. The all new Nissan Aria is a fully loaded EV. It's brimming with style mm. and power. Up to 389 horses of it. Innovation and intelligence. E-Force all wheel drive. It'll pin you to your seat. Your very plush seat. The all new all electric Nissan Aria. Nissan Aria with E-Force expect availability early 2023. E-Force cannot prevent collisions or provide enhanced traction in all conditions. E-Force and 389 horsepower available on Platinum Plus. Nissan calculation using one foot rollout testing with long range battery and E-Force only in Fort Worth with E-Step off. These results are for comparison only and should not be attempted on public roads. Drive responsibly. See NissanUSA.com for details. And story number three comes from Debbie. I grew up over a funeral home. It was a huge, beautiful apartment over the business that was started by my grandparents in 1948. My bedroom was the entire third floor of the building, so my house was a regular hangout for my friends and me. Of course, we did the whole Ouija board thing, nothing ever happened, other than one of us moving the planchette to spell bad words, and watched scary movies with them not getting much sleep those nights. Several things happened over the years to me and my mother that I would love to share. My bedroom was long and narrow with slanted ceilings. My bed was at one end of the room, and I had a small TV with a push button and dials for controls, with no remote. The TV would turn off on its own while I was sleeping. I figured it was just overheating or something and would roll over and go to sleep. I had a touch lamp that I would wake up in the middle of the night and it would be on. I put it down to humidity or static electricity. I would feel the bed jiggle like my cat had jumped up 
but the door was closed and she wasn't in the room. I figured maybe I had done one of those jerks as I was falling asleep and I just felt the jostle as I came all the way awake. Those stories may or may not have had explanations, but I convinced myself it was nothing. The following stories are a bit less explainable. When I was little, I was a terrible sleeper. I would get up in the middle of the night and wake my mom up because I was awake so apparently everyone else needed to be up too. One night, my mom was awakened to the sound of knocking on the side of my dad's dresser. She got up to get me, saying, What are you doing? And as she came around the dresser, the knocking stopped and I wasn't there. Another time, she was sitting doing her morning ablutions and while looking in the mirror felt a firm hand on her shoulder. She didn't feel any fear, but definitely thought it was strange. But the most unexplainable thing that happened to her was one evening the funeral home had been locked up for the night, and we were all sitting in the living room watching TV and the doorbell rang. My mom went to see who was at the door, and there was no one there, but the one side of the double doors was propped open. The locks on these doors were the kind that the stationary door locked into the top and bottom of the door jam, and the locking door is a keyed on the inside and out deadbolt. She kind of shrugged it off thinking maybe that door hadn't been locked properly and went back upstairs. A while later the doorbell rang again and my mom went back to check the door. Again it was propped open but this time the deadbolt was sticking straight out. No damage to either door. Now a little spooked she relocked the doors and triple checked it was secure. Once more the doorbell rang. This time both doors were propped open with the deadbolt still sticking out. Nothing else happened that evening, but she said it still creeps her out. Who or what could have been unlocking the doors with no key and no damage to either door? The last thing that happened to me at the funeral home was one evening after I was married and my parents had built a house and moved out, I was there cleaning. The whole funeral home was dark and just had the one hall light, the ladies room light and the office light on as I finished up working. All of a sudden, the telephone in the garage extension started ringing, but it was just a continual ring with no pauses. Being alone, in the dark and having some strange noises spooked me, but I got up the nerve to stick my head into the garage to look. There was a casket right below the phone, ready to be taken to the front the next morning. As much as I know, it's the live ones you need to worry about and I noped out of there in a hurry. Several years ago, my friends and I went to the Rolling Hills Asylum in East Bethany. We got many pictures of orbs and just a general creepiness of the place. We were in the attic at one end and two of my friends decided to go to a room that had a small TV in it that the resident would sit and watch all day, every day, that was on the other end of the building. It is said that he does not like people to sit in his chair. I decided that I was going to join my two friends at the other end of the building as nothing was happening in the room the larger group was in. As I was walking down the hall which was pitch black, I had a horrible sense that something was behind me. As I ran sideways to keep my back against the wall, I burst into the room with my two friends. The next day, my friend was listening to a digital recorder that she had brought. Right before I came into the room, she had asked, Can I sit in your chair? And then you hear me come in giggling nervously. Immediately after, there was a loud, long male sigh. We heard nothing in the moment, only on the recording. Lastly, in the house that I currently live in quite a while ago, I was laying in bed reading. And because my husband worked nights, the ringer in the bedroom had been turned to mute. I all of a sudden heard my name being called several times, like the answering machine picked up and somebody was trying to get my attention. I thought, I'll call back when I finish this chapter. I got up and looked and no one had called. About a year ago I was in bed and I'd just turned off the TV to go to sleep for the night and my husband was in the living room still watching TV. I may have just started dozing off, but I'm not sure how long I was laying there when I had a feeling like someone was in the room. I opened my eyes and there was a large shadow at the end of my bed leaning over me. I screamed once loudly and then it was gone. A bit creeped out, but I did fall asleep that night. The next morning I said to my hubby, Did you hear me yell last night? And he said, That's what I heard. Great to know if I was being attacked, he would come and save me. That would definitely be me. I'd be like, Yeah, yeah, I heard something. But I wasn't about to check what it was. Sounded scary. So what what am I going to do about it? 
I would imagine, Debbie, that throughout your life, people have found it sort of strange that you've lived above a funeral home or whatever. Or I'm sure even some people listening would be like, oh, that's so creepy. But I think it's a very noble thing to do to be in the funeral business. And when you're when you've done it for a long time, it just becomes a part of your life. However, that being said, I have no problem being around dead bodies. It wouldn't make me uncomfortable seeing a body laid out. It wouldn't make me uncomfortable knowing that I was in a building or a room with dead bodies. It wouldn't bother me. If one of those phones started ringing, I would absolutely jump out of my skin and assume that it was somehow the dead contacting me, without a doubt. Also, who are you going wandering around Rolling Hills Asylum on your own? How brave are you? Whatever about living in a funeral home, wandering around Rolling Hills on your own, I absolutely would not. I know that you were going from one group of friends to another, but there's no way I'd be going on my own. No, absolutely no way. I would be like plankton at that point, only existing in large groups. There's no way I would be wandering around there on my own to be eaten by ghosts or whatever it is that happens in those places. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of Real Life Ghost Stories. Thank you to Anonymous Lindsay and Debbie for sending in your stories. Remember, the last story came from the 31st of October 2022. And if you would like to send in your story, you can do so by emailing it to reallifeghoststoriespodcast at gmail.com. You can also check out the website reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com. And if you are desperate for extra content, you can sign up to Patreon. That is patreon.com forward slash stories, where for $5 a month or $2 a month, you get access to heaps of extra content, as well as every single main and mini episode completely ad free. And on that note, I shall see you next time. The Jeep Grand Cherokee 4xe. It's electrified. Boogie, woogie, woogie. So you can boogie, woogie, woogie into the forest. Boogie. Boogie, woogie, woogie through the mud. Or boogie, woogie, woogie to work. Where you boogie, woogie, woogie down the hall to your boss's office to tell him you quit. Sure got the boogie. Then you boogie, woogie, woogie to the elevator. As he boogie, woogie, woogies after you, begging, please, take me with you. Boogie. The electrified Jeep Grand Cherokee 4xe. Learn more at Jeep.com. Jeep is a registered trademark of FCA US LLC.